Well, I had been considering taking a short break from our study through the Gospel of John. And then a couple weeks ago at prayer meeting, Joel said, hey, have you ever considered doing a topical series? I said, why? I, actually, yes, I have done some in the past, and why not now? So, one, two, three, confirmation. We're going to do a uh, either three or four sermons on spiritual warfare. And this is part one. And did you know that there's a war going on? Absolutely. I don't mean in Iraq or Afghanistan or where, wherever human conflict is. In fact, the idea of war is often used as a, as a metaphor and as a call to arms, as, as a way to say, oh, you should be alarmed about this. Um, wow, it was only 19 years ago that the war on terror, as if terror had no face, <laughs> It was just the abstract terror. Back in the 60s, many of our social uh, ills today were brought about through a war on poverty. Well, let's face it, if you pay someone to work, they're not going to work. And that's a lot of our problems today. And these days, it's, it's either a war on systemic racism, that, that language is used, or a war for democracy. Yeah, just fill in the blanks. There's nothing new here. But it's also a very, very common metaphor for the Christian struggle called spiritual warfare. And there are a lot of misconceptions and ditches that we must avoid, but the fact of its existence is undeniable. I'm not going to spend a lot of time dismantling what has become popular as spiritual warfare. I just want to begin here, not with the outside forces, but with our own lives. As First Peter says, it's time for judgment to begin with the house of God. So turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. We'll be looking at verses 10 through 20, kind of from a helicopter standpoint. I'm not going to really dig in and exegete the whole passage, but this gives us a basis upon which we can, we can fight our own lives, and have victory over all the forces that are against us. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done any, everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word. With all prayer and peti petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am, I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So if you notice on the back of your bulletin, I have three points. And as a good Baptist, they are all alliterative. In other words, we have the reality of the war. Number two, resources for the war. And number three, the results of the war. So first of all, the reality. This is the condition we find ourselves in. In Ephesians chapters 4 and 5, Paul has been writing to this church about how they are to apply all of the incredible blessings of salvation that he had just told them in chapters 1 through 3. So how do they apply them? Well, first of all, in society generally, that would be like we would see in 417, walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. In the church community, 
That would be as in Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And then he takes that from general society to the church, then to the family. First of all, in marriage, in the family, Ephesians 5, and then chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And to work, actually the responsibility that Christians have as they are employed or employer or master and slave, as the case may be. So in the realm of all of your life, in society, in the church, in marriage, in family, and in work, you are going to be in a battle and the battle is for your soul. Now, before we get to the implications of, like I said earlier, spiritual warfare for the church or for society, I quoted it already. 1 Peter 4.17 says, It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God, and it begins with us first. Why? Well, he goes on and says, What would be the outcome for those who don't believe the gospel? So it Peter makes this argument, if the church can't figure this out and get this right according to God's word, then why would we ex expect the rest of society to get it right too, okay? And as our, our great novelist Herman Melville wrote, the church is the prow of the culture. So Paul begins his conclusion to his whole letter with a finally. Now, if you know anything about uh, apostles or pastors, finally means that it's not finally, there's a lot to come. Finally, in closing, and everyone looks at their watch as their stomachs go. But he concludes this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So this battle is real, and if you're going to be victorious in the battle, you can't look inside. It's the opposite of all the advice you would get from Dr. Phil or Oprah or anyone. Just look in your heart. No, my, my heart's not trustworthy. I want to look somewhere else. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. See, any defensive victory or offensive victory is going to happen in the strength of the Lord, in the Lord's strength. It's the most foolish thing that any Christian can say is, well, that would never happen to me. Oh, <laughs> really? You know, better saints than I have fallen for... Wow. In Joshua 1, 6 through 9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's always through the power of the Lord. Any, any spiritual progress that we're going to make will always be by God's grace and the means of grace that God has given us through the Spirit, through the Word of God, through the church through your brothers and sisters, and his working in you. So first of all, the battle is real. It's not an option. You're going to have to fight. And if you're going to fight, you do it by the strength of the Lord. Verse 11, put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So all of it, that, that implies there that this person... That's you and I that he's writing to is a soldier in some capacity. You are one of Christ's or a soldier in the army of the Lord. Jason, remember that old song we used to sing? Yeah. Kind of repetitious, but it was fun because you would march. Yeah. He says, put on the full armor. Don't, don't have a partial defense or partial offense. Be equipped. We've been studying so much about how the, the Word of God is, is inspired of God and is useful. It's the, it's the one thing that we need to learn from as far as our own spiritual lives and our own walk with Christ and our actions in the world. Uh, with teaching, correcting, rebuking, training in righteousness to be fully equipped for every good work. Well, we're getting it. Full armor. There's an exhortation as well to stand and fight, not to run away from the fight or to give in. The fact is that our enemy, the devil, with all the principalities and powers, is older than you, and he's more clever than you, 
And he's been around so long and he's more tenacious than you and he will use every resource to hamstring you. If you know from another military analogy, to hamstring a horse means the horse cannot be used. Oftentimes they would, they would capture a whole bunch of guys and they don't want the horses falling into enemy, enemy hands. They would hamstring them all. They can't run. Well, that's what the enemy wants to do with you. And it says, so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. Schemes. Wily. He's, he's wily. He's, he's strategy. If you've ever read any literature on, on certain underclass, we would say like, like people that are gypsies, who are not wise, but they're very, very clever. They can hide their tracks. I don't, I don't mean as, a, as an ethnic group. I mean the practice of living off of other people. I should tell you sometime about the story of helping my grandma, Bushong, who passed away in 2000, um, not be taken in by gypsies. It was, you know, she's so trusting. Well, he had a, he had a tie on, so. He was a nice looking young man. Oh. But, the, but the enemy is tricky. He's beyond our intelligence. Now all this, you know, we have the folk tales relating to the devil went down to Georgia and we got him on a technicality. That's all hogwash. In fact, if we look at Christ's response to the devil in his temptation in the desert, Luke 4 and, and in Matthew, he said it's every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Satan would use some of the words from the mouth of God to try to tempt Jesus. Not all the words. And we're being told here it's all the armor, every piece of it. And of course, the result of that was Satan left him for a more opportune time. So we must stand firm in the Christian faith, which is the, the revealed truth. This is objective truth, not some unseen cosmic force or spirit that pervades everything, but we're talking about the whole deposit of Christian faith and truth. So since Satan is a deceiver and a liar, we can successfully resist him, but only on the basis of the truth. In verse 12, Paul sets out what's really behind the scenes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in, high, in heavenly places. Hasn't Paul already said something about heavenly places in the book of Ephesians? Well, yeah, back in chapter 1, he has seated us with him in heavenly places, and now he says the battle takes place in heavenly places. What, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, we're looking at this as a struggle. What, what's the King James Version? We wrestle not against, right? And the Greek word there is strabloo. I think I'm saying that right. And it really, it's to, it's to twist or to wrench. In Greco-Roman wrestling, it wasn't like our wrestling where there are strict rules and there's a ref. It was pretty much no, hold, no holds barred, literally. Anything goes in that kind of wrestling. And anything would go outside of no outside weapons, poking in the eye, grabbing, twisting. Everything was used to try to take your opponent down. Now, in, in the Christian life, we are not saying that you coerce people physically. It's not by coercion. It's the power of the gospel. And it's the power of God himself. The world wages war in a certain way. It, 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 is, it is set by superior weaponry, strategy, the long-term goal of the, of the invading forces. If you remember from Gods and Generals, the, the Joshua Chamberlain speech where he says, at the end of Fredericksburg, the, the horrible defeat of the Union Army by the Confederates at Fredericksburg, and Josh Chamberlain says, I, I don't know how else to do this. War is coercion. Well, the enemy wages war by coercion, but we don't. We wage war by the power of the Spirit of God, by the strength of the Lord Almighty. 
And we'll be looking at 2 Corinthians 10 more in detail later on, but let me read it because it's important to this topic. For 2 Corinthians 10, 3-5, and 3 through 5, For though we walk in the flesh, so in other words, we are in fleshed beings, we're not floating out there in the ether, we don't wage war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. God, so many, so many war metaphors. You'd think there's a battle going on. He goes on to say what this is. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I used to hear about these groups of young people that would look at this and they would get groups and they would march around a city and, and tear down the strongholds over Cochineros or whatever the local nightclub was. It's, it's not what Paul's talking about here. He's saying, yeah, they, there are real powers behind the ideas that are opposed to God. So we can deal with the ideas, we can deal with the philosophies that set themselves up against the knowledge of God, but all the time remembering that these come from the enemy. Remember, everything is absolutely binary. You're either for Jesus or against him. It's either God's truth or it's not. And oftentimes the side over here, the not, takes a little bit of God's truth, leaves something out or adds something to it, and comes up with the opposite of God's truth. So our, our warfare is not the fleshly carnal kind. So what are the resources that God has given? That's the reality of the battle. It's real. Can't resist or you can't avoid it. What are the resources? Therefore, verse 13, take up the full armor of God that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. So the point is that after you're fighting, you can actually stand. You won't be mortally wounded. You can still, after withstanding, you can stand. What is this armor? Well, quite simply, it's, this is modeled on what a Roman soldier would have been wearing before he goes to battle. First of all, it consists of the belt of truth. And of course, as a Christian, we don't just know of the truth, but we are committed to the truth. The breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is God's word. See, none of these pieces of armor hint at any secret technique of tearing down strongholds and praying against demons or whatever. In fact, if people talk today about a demon over Vegas, well, they're 2,000 years too late. That's not the reality anymore. It used to be before the incarnation, death, burial. Yeah, remember in, in Daniel, uh, the, the archangel said, I, I, I was going to be here earlier, but I had to stop and do a little business with the prince of Persia, speaking of another, of a demonic power. Well, now the strong man is bound, Jesus says, and at this point, the devil can't keep the nations deceived. The gospel will go forth. So we're not talking about binding the spirit of lust over the strip bar. You actually have to deal with people, right? But the idea of the strip bar does come from the enemy. So rather, these are speaking of a clear understanding, solid commitment to truth and holiness. And in fact, this, these aren't the first times. If you have a New American Standard, you'll see some of these uh, pieces of armor in all caps. Well, that's because it's quoting the old Greek version of the Old Testament there. In Isaiah 59, 17, speaking of Jesus, the Messiah, Isaiah says, he puts on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. So as we are united to Jesus, therefore we have these pieces of armor. So verse 14, stand firm, therefore, having girded your loins with truth. Now that is a thing we don't say anymore. Gird up your loins. We, you know what that's speaking of, though. In those days, it wasn't 
blue jeans like this. It was more like a tunic. And you could do most of life's activities with your tunic loose. However, when it came to battle, they had this process by which you would take your belt, your sash, and loop it around. Kind of look like you're wearing a big diaper. But your legs were free. So you gird up your loins with this belt. Uh, other version, I think the uh, New International, stand firm with the belt of truth around your waist. Now, this wasn't just like my belt, just cowhide. No, this was a thick army belt with hooks and clasps and loops on it, fastening devices so that all your weaponry was ready to go. Well, that's our weapon, is the truth. First of all, never take for granted the fact that you can know truth. We can know truly. Isn't that the enemy of much of our faith today? Who are you to say? How can you know? Who gave you the cosmic helicopter that can see all of us poor mortals down here and give us a word from God? Well, as D.A. Carson said, in a postmodern world where there's no truth, or even if there is truth, you can't know truth because it always gets messed up between the communicator and the listener. He says this, an omniscient talking God changes everything. An omniscient, all-knowing, speaking God changes everything. And this is where we, we say, no, we can know truth. We can have truth. And even in the, in the university, we're not surprised that Postmodernism has taken such a, such a toll on people. But in the church, it's even coming here as well. And I always say, listen, if you're going to be like that, then I guess Elijah's speech to the prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel would have gone something like this. Hey, you guys, I'm Elijah. I'm pretty sure I heard from God, although I don't want to be so arrogant as to tell you what would be right for you. But I'm pretty sure that God said that he'd rather you didn't do all that baby sacrifice and worshiping demons. Maybe if he could tone it down. Again, don't want to be arrogant or come off like I know stuff. I'm being facetious. So yeah, we can know truth. That's the, that's the, the belt of truth. It's where everything else hangs. You can, you can think of it that way. The belt of truth, everything else hangs off of that. Even carrying their great big shield, it would hook on so they didn't have to carry it out here and ruin your uh, rotator cuff, whatever. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness. So your belt, everything can, connects to that, including this. But a breastplate of right, what does a breastplate protect? Well, they used to say it's your, your vitals, your vital organs your heart, your lungs, your liver, pancreas, intestines. The breastplate of righteousness keeps you alive. You can't live without these organs. Okay, the appendix. We don't know what that's there for anyway. But anything else. And so if you're in Christ, you have this breastplate of righteousness. In one sense, it's positional because of Christ's imputed righteousness to you, which doesn't make you righteous. It means God declares you righteous. And then there's the wholehearted followers of Jesus become practically more and more righteous. But it begins with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what the enemy wants to do is get past that breastplate and establish a beachhead you know what that is. If you can get your foot on the beach, then you can get the rest of your troops on and start invading the country for real. But you don't want that. So what happens when you sin and you knowingly sin? You might feel sorry for it, but unless you repent, that's a beachhead of the enemy. And that positional righteous, righteousness now becomes something that you question. Verse 15, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. What is the, what is the peace that we enjoy through the gospel? It's, it's peace with God. It's shalom. There's this, it's not just a ceasefire. It's not just armistice, but it's actual shalom, real peace. 
The dividing wall of hostility between people groups has done because of the dividing wall of hostility between us and God. And see, these weren't just tennis shoes. These shoes that the soldier would wear, they had these things called greaves on them. They were connected. They would protect your shin from spikes and thorns and everything so you can keep walking forward. So we're to be ready says, with the preparation of the gospel, that means to be ready with the gospel, ready in the gospel. Isaiah 52 says, how blessed are the feet of them that bring good news. That's what the gospel is. Frank, you can wear boots when you walk. You don't need greaves, but you've got the gospel. That's the thing that matters. And then verse 16, in addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you are able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. So, so far, all of these pieces of armor are what in nature? They're defensive. Um, these shield, by the way, they would be about the size of a door. We've all seen the films where they lock together like, a, like the turtle, like a phalanx, like a turtle shell, and they can move forward. But it's because they don't want to be killed as they're moving forward. And these shields that the Roman soldiers had were generally made of wood and leather. They, they weren't solid wood. It was like a wood frame with leather across. And before battle, they would soak them in water. Why is that? So that the enemy's flaming arrows wouldn't catch them on fire. So it says it's a shield of faith. Well, what is faith? It's, it's belief in God, trusting in his promises, that wholehearted commitment to Jesus. So what are, these, what are these fiery darts that the shield of faith puts out? Well, I think we can easily say number one would be the temptation to doubt what God has said. I mean, think of it in, line of your own, in light of your own fleshly temptation, in light of all the pressure you would get from the outside to conform to society and our laws and our ways. Remember the early Roman Christians were persecuted because, well, they're not with us. And even the temptation of the enemy. Sometimes you ever wonder, where did that thought come from? I was doing pretty good. Why did I say that? Why did I think that? Where's that? So yeah, we, we can be have a fiery dart that is tempting us to not trust God. 1 Thessalonians 5.21, hold fast to that which is good. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast to the pattern of sound teaching. Hold fast. There's the old sailor with the, don't let go, right? It's an anchor for your soul, God's word is. There's another one. What about the, the guilt of sin? How many of us sinned this week and now we're walking around with the accuser going, yeah, but you sinned, man. You think you're, oh, you're good. Oh, really going to go to church and everything's cool. But you, you know what you did. Yeah. Are your sins really covered? That's, that's another fiery dart where you say, I, I know I sinned. I'm imperfect, but, but Jesus is Lord and I'm forgiven. Verse 17, the helmet of salvation. This protects the head. Obviously, it protects how you think. And how do you think about yourself in this world? Are you one of his? Are you saved? What about when, when bad stuff happens? Do you grieve in a way that is hopeless? No, we have hope. We have the hope of salvation, past, present, and future. The helmet of salvation, it protects how you think, and it protects really where all of this gets processed. And finally, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word. There it is. There's our offensive weapon. And again, we can, we can go back and look at the temptation of Christ. We have to be assured, though, but before the battle commences, we have to have this armor on, ready to go. And we have to be assured that the enemy has no hold in these areas because we stand firm on the Word of God. And in fact, we can inflict damage to the enemy with the sword of the Spirit, it's pointed and sharp. This, this type of, of Roman sword was intended to penetrate the enemy. 
And of course, we may, may think of uh, Hebrews 4.12, the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. I love how Vody Bauckham says says this when it, when it regards to apologetics to atheists or agnostics. He says, what many Christians do is they'll put away the main weapon and sheathe it and go out and talk about how the universe is fine-tuned or how evolution couldn't be true. He said, why did you sheathe your most valuable weapon? Hath not God said, well, here's the sword of the Spirit. This is what God has said. I recommend Vody if you didn't know that already. See, when we resist Satan by taking our stand in the armor of God's truth, what is his response? Well, he has to flee. We have the Spirit of God. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will free, flee from you. See, the problem is many of us don't resist. We want to think, oh, let's, let's skirmish a little longer with whatever it is that we think pleases our flesh. And the Bible says, no, 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 you resist. Resist him, stand firm in the faith. There's no armor for your back. You're not talking about running from sin, that you do. But when it comes to the enemy, you don't give up, you don't give in, you hold fast. So yes, uh, there's no magic phrase that we can say that will bind Satan. But God has not left us without a divine strategy for dealing with him. God's strategy centers on the objective truth of God's word, not our own subjective feelings or experience. We just had a conversation with someone who said, I know that's true, but I just feel. Can't go with that. Begins with sound doctrine affecting every year. Now, finally, in closing, what are the results of this war? so that we can stand in the day of adversity. Here's the fact that an untested faith is an unproven faith. An untested faith is unsure. Anyone can say they believe in God, talk is cheap, that they trust in God, but words can be pretty empty. And God is merciful. He tests our faith. And it must bear affliction and temptation and we learn the extent of our faith by seeing how well it stands up to this kind of spiritual battle. You can look up uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 12 through 13 uh, later today if you want. If you think you're standing firm, be careful. This is all in the strength of the Lord. <coughs> the result of the battle is that God's people remain on their feet even in the worst of the conflict. Just some assorted passages. Therefore, my dear brothers, when you, you know, it's interesting when you start looking for something in the Bible in the right way, you're looking for a pattern. How many times do you see this? There's some free Bible software. I highly recommend it. There's some online stuff. You can just type in the word and see how much it comes up. Stand firm, my dear brethren, let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith. Be men of courage, be strong. 1 Corinthians 619. That other one was 1 Corinthians 15. We work with you for your joy because it is by faith you stand firm. Philippians 4.1. Therefore, my brothers, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, is how you should stand firm in the Lord. So again, <clears throat> over and over, there's this struggle that we're assuming is part of the Christian life. There's also the result of standing firm after you've had a battle. There's one final weapon, and that's prayer. Verses 18 through 20. With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Look at that. With all prayer and petition, all time in the Spirit. He's not, he's not talking about a prayer language. He means empowered by the Spirit of God, pray for everything. 
Pray for those things mentioned in the Lord's Prayer. We could start there. Those, that's beautiful. Actually, we've been talking about employing the Lord's Prayer in our worship service here. Be on the alert. That, mean, that means to be prepared, be ready. Prepare your minds for action. That's 1 Peter 1.13. Prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you. These are all related to these, these pieces of spiritual armor that we've been talking about. The end of all things is near, 1 Peter 4, 7. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. There, the, the order is a little reversed, isn't it? Be alert, be self-controlled so that your prayer is able to be done. And then finally, this final point of this passage, that in proclaiming it, Paul says, it, the gospel, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. A Greek word there is parisia. It, means, it basically means to be frank. It's kind of a blunt speech. It's a confident speech, plain speaking. It's one of the things that, that marks out a true man of God from someone who's playing the game. Someone who's, who's confident of the word, he's going to be able to be, be blunt and be plain speaking. Let's not pull punches where God's throwing them. Of course, we don't want to, as the Bible says of Jesus, extinguish a smoldering wick or you know, the, the bruised reed he will not crush. That's oftentimes the the balancing act in, in Christian life and in pastoral ministry is saying, was this person a genuine smoldering wick or is he just a hypocrite? Or, you know, I really need to get blunt with. And the thing is, unless someone's a total hypocrite, unless you're a hypocrite, then if you speak bluntly about the gospel, um, it, it only can be done by wearing this full armor of God, where again, you've, you're standing on the truth Everything's hanging on the truth of the gospel, the truth of the Bible. You've got the shield of faith, the sword of the Spirit, the helmet. Your feet are protected. You're ready to go. All this is by God's grace. So the struggle is real. And no one's exempt. So think about your own life this morning. How, how is your belt of truth hanging by a thread? or firmly buckled up, girded your loins. So again, I hope this is, this is helpful and convicting to us. Next couple weeks, we're going to be looking at how this plays out in society and in the church and in politics even. But really, it has to start with us. We have to be able to stand firm to do so, not because we think we're something else. It's because we love our neighbor. We love God, first of all, and his truth, and then we love our neighbor as ourselves. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the equipping that you have given us, all of these wonderful pieces of spiritual armor that protects and helps, helps us to stand firm in this evil, wicked day. Lord, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So, Father, help, help us, none of us, to be hamstrung in our efforts to be soldiers in your kingdom. Help us to never flee from the battle, but to stand firm. And keep us safe and keep us wise. In Christ's name, amen.